Thank you, Renee. What a wonderful song to celebrate Easter and Palm Sunday to think that Peter, when he jumped out on the water there to walk with Jesus and the waves were coming, but Jesus made a way and he makes us brave. And so, so glad you're with us today. Uh, we uh, had no power this morning and so uh, we, we got to church and all the lights were out and wondering what to do and we had a candlelight Palm Sunday service, the first service, and so it was a, a wonderful time together and had fun with the kids in church too. Um, our condolences to the Runquist family. Corey Runquist lost her father uh, this past week and so if you keep her in your prayers and to Dave Hijack and Jackie and their family losing Dave's father this past week. <clears throat> it's not easy, but for the hope for the Christian, what a beautiful hope, that we will be reunited. I buried both my father and my mother, and I have a wonderful hope that I'm going to see them again uh, in heaven, and we're going to live together forever. What a, what a hope for the Christian. Isn't that wonderful? And so that's the hope that we want to give to the world around us, that there's this life is so temporary. Uh, even if we live to be 95, 100 years old, it goes quick, doesn't it? And we need to be ready to meet Jesus. Well, let's pray that God would speak to our hearts through his word today. Heavenly Father, thank you that you're with us today, that <clears throat> you have given your son to die on the cross for our sins, to make a way for us to have eternal life. And we thank you that you're here today. Speak to each heart's uh, individually, each one of our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're uh, going to be focusing today on uh, going back uh, 2,000 years. <clears throat> uh, Jesus started his ministry when he was 30 years old. He had, 30, he had three years to accomplish his ministry, three years. That's not a long time when you think of... Uh, you're going to impact all of humanity in three years. And he spent the majority of his time in the uh, Galilee region, <clears throat> speaking to people, and of course Jerusalem, uh, where he shared his heart. But today we're going to focus on the last week, the final week to make an impact. The final week. Just think about it. you got one week left to pour your life into this world that Satan has tried to destroy. You've got a week left. You've been working in the lives of these apostles and disciples, and he had many friends, <clears throat> but he had one week left. And so <clears throat> it was before, as we go back in time, it was before the, the Lutheran church was ever around. It was before the Anglican church was ever around. It was before you'd ever hear the word Presbyterian. It wasn't heard of. Uh, the word Christian had not been penned yet. They, the word Christian was never used at this time. That's how far we're going back. And to see that one man made such an impact on humanity that throughout the world, uh, this, this coming week, uh, there will be Millions of people worshiping Jesus on this planet. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? And that's the impact that one man made on society 2,000 years ago. And now it's his last week. Uh, he's with his disciples. And so we'll go to the Gospel of John today to begin <clears throat> sharing together. In the last week, Christ had on earth as a human being. And then, of course, he spent time with his disciples after the resurrection. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the uh, essence of nard and the, uh, anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance. And we get that picture. It was expensive. This, this ointment was worth a year's wages, the average wage of the day. Uh, that's how expensive this perfume was. And Mary sacrificed that for Jesus. 
But Judas Iscariot, the disciple would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Just think, here's one of the disciples. And, and he was upset that it it's, sometimes can happen even in church, can't it? Where we, we put on this uh, spiritual act when in reality we're not anything close to that. Uh, living that way at home or in the real life. God wants us to be the real deal, doesn't he? That's what he wants for all of us, to be uh, at home the same as we are in church, not putting on a facade. Uh, Judas was, said he was concerned about the poor, but he really wasn't. He was concerned about himself and, uh, and himself only. And so this was penned, of course, uh, after the resurrection of Christ and after he ascended to the Father. Uh, the Apostle John wrote this book for us, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he was telling us about who Judas really was. After Judas had hung himself, uh, this was written. And Jesus replied to Judas, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. When the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. For it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, Praise God! Blessing on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hail to the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about his miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, There's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. A picture of Jesus and who he was and what was happening in his final week on planet Earth. The Pharisees, of course, were concerned People were leaving the synagogue. They were following Jesus. <clears throat> this cult, they looked at it as a cult. And, and, of course, they didn't want that to start. But Jesus came lowly, and they called, they said, Hell, the king of Israel, he came on a donkey, uh, portraying, of course, the humility of God Almighty, God in the flesh, humility. He came riding on a donkey to fulfill the scripture. In Samuel, 2 Samuel, the Lord <clears throat> gave David this prophetic word. He said, David, I'm not going to take away your kingdom. Yours is going to be an everlasting kingdom. And from an eternal kingdom, where you, from your throne, it, you will reign forever on this kingdom. Jesus, we see, was the fulfillment of this prophecy Jesus the son of David they call him the son of David he came from the lineage of David and he was born in in, in uh, of course Bethlehem I want to just go back to that just for a minute uh, because even at his birth we see the prophetic word of his kingdom and the reign of David David's kingdom so turn with me to Luke chapter 1 <clears throat> If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 1, and we will look at, uh, we'll start with verse 26. <clears throat> In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, 
a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Just imagine that picture that we read about this at Christmas, but now here we see that angel Gabriel came to Mary and greeted her. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High, the Son of God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can these things happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she's now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I love that verse, don't you? Nothing is impossible with God with God. Here uh, the angel told her that D Jesus would be born uh, and that the Lord would give him the throne of his ancestor David and he'll reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Now certainly a kingdom has those who are in his kingdom, the subjects, the, his, his people. Today whether you realize it or not, if you're a Christian, you are a part of something more amazing that, could, that you could ever imagine. You are a part of a kingdom that we're talking about here that was fulfilled with Jesus. We're talking about a kingdom that we're a part of that we may see the same Jesus that they were looking forward to seeing him come and take over the Romans and take over Israel and be the king. They thought he would set up his kingdom at that time. That's what the disciples were thinking. They were still confused about what was going on and what is he talking about, his death and his burial. He's talking about an everlasting kingdom where he would reign forever and ever. This kingdom was prophesied hundreds and hundreds of years before. And we're a part of that kingdom. You're a part of that kingdom if you're a Christian. In our lifetime, we are seeing some of the, some of the climactic events that will unfold when Jesus himself will come back to planet Earth. And this time, he's not going to be coming on a donkey. He's going to be coming on a white horse. And he's going to be ruling and reigning and coming in power and setting up his kingdom in a place called Jerusalem in Israel where the world is coming against them. Right? Right now, isn't it amazing that little country? Why is everyone so concerned about it? Why, is everyone, why, why do people want to destroy the Jews? Why, why do they hate Israel? Because Satan hates God. That's why. And here we see... Even our own country, the United States, that is, is kind of going backwards on, 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 on what they want to do with Israel. They're not as, they're not as pro-Israel as they should be. Any amens? Okay, I'm glad you're here. All right. In the Bible it says, those who bless Israel, God will bless. And those who curse Israel, God will curse. Pray and, and talk to your politicians. We need to be pro-Israel. We need to pray for Israel. Jesus is coming back to that place of Israel. The, the true Messiah will reign in Israel. He's going to set up a kingdom after there's going to be a war. There's going to be a war, isn't there? And he's going to come. And they're going to come. And the Bible tells us there are going to be nations coming against Israel to destroy it. But Jesus... Is going to flex his muscles at that time. Our, tr our true champion. And Israel will be saved. And many will come to know him as their personal Messiah. And it says, friends, that we, we Christians, 
are going to be part of that kingdom. We are a part of it now. We are the ones he left to, to go out into the world as, as his servants and to bring many others to Christ. He left that work to his disciples, and we as Christians are his disciples. And so here we're seeing we're a part of something greater than we could ever imagine, the kingdom of Almighty God. We are a part of it. Jesus is my king. I hope he's your king too. Jesus is my king, and that means he's sovereign. He's sovereign in this universe. He deserves to be sovereign in my heart. And that means he's in charge, right? That means he's on the throne. That means I go to him and I live according to what he says. He's sovereign. God wants us to press in and get to know our wonderful Lord and Savior better than we ever have. Than we ever have. It's so important to do that. Uh, to have our time alone with him. And I was reading in my devotional this week how as, as time with God, this one woman was sharing her testimony in this devotional. And as she was sharing her testimony, she was talking about how uh, her, her quiet time with God was so important to her, having her devotions and reading her Bible and prayer. But she, she realized as she had... As she had uh, written things down uh, in a journal and journaled her thoughts throughout the years, looking back at her journal, that her conversation with God was a dialogue and not a monologue. Pretty interesting. And, and as I, I, I considered that, I thought, she's talking with God and it's a one-way, it was a monologue, not a dialogue, a one-way conversation. She was talking but not listening to God respond. Isn't that interesting? And, and think of your own prayer life. Are you having a conversation with God, or are you just doing the talking? Boy, God, I'm really in a mess. I need money. I've got to pay the bills. The kids are sick. Help, help, help. And, you know, so often all we do is ask God for things. We never have that conversation with him. The God of the universe wants to be intimate with each one of us. Do you believe that? He wants to have a conversation with you in your devotional time. But the problem is, we are too busy in our own life. Uh, we have our cell phone beeping and, and ringing, and, and it's always something interrupting us. And even in our time with God, one of the things I have to be reminded of is to turn my cell phone off so I'm not interrupted when I'm having my devotions. Not to be distracted. Does God really want a conversation with you? Does he want to be intimate with you? Does he want to talk to you? And how does he talk to us? Well, the Bible tells us that he'll speak to us through his word. We have the Holy Bible. He speaks to us. So when we read God's word, we should be looking to see how he's speaking to us through his word. Sometimes that word will jump off the pages right into your heart. And you'll say, well, that's just what I needed from God today. But he speaks to us through what is called a still, small voice. And that voice is a quiet voice, isn't it? He usually doesn't speak to us in an audible voice, does he? Not too many of us have heard an audible voice from God. I haven't heard an audible voice from God, but I've heard his voice. And as a Christian in his kingdom, being part of his kingdom, he wants you to listen to him. He may speak to you to, to maybe talk to another person about him, to witness to them, to share God's love. He may speak to your heart to to call somebody that you haven't talked to for a while. He may speak to your, your heart more intimately. I remember when I lived in Friedenburg, I was driving down the road, and I've shared this with some of you, but I was driving down Taft Road, heading towards home, and <clears throat> just driving, and all of a sudden I hear that whisper, and it was very intimate, and it said, Thor, I love you. And it caught me by attention, my attention, and I thought, was that God? Was that really you, God? Or was it me? Did I just say, Thor, I love you? Right? 
Um, was it, I know it wasn't the devil, because he doesn't love me. There's usually three voices you hear, okay? I just want to tell you this. If you hear more, you should see someone else. Don't see me. All right. Uh, but there's usually three voices. You'll either hear your own voice, God's voice, or a demonic force that would be tempting you or whispering something in you or telling you you're no good, uh, you're, you're worth nothing. Uh, and people hear those things, don't they? People hear things and they feel like they're worthless. But I heard that day, I heard the voice, Thor, I love you. Well, one thing I've learned as a Christian is that when you hear God's voice, it will always line up and be correct with his word, with his written word. And so I thought, oh God, was that really you? In the middle of the day, just saying you love me? He said, why don't you believe that? What does my word tell you? And immediately John 3.16 came to my mind. And I put it in the first person, for God so loved Thor, that he gave his only son, Jesus, to die for Thor, for me. So if Thor should put his trust in him, he'd never perish, but Thor would have everlasting life. And I just started crying in my car, thinking how intimate God wants to be with all of us when we listen to that small voice. And his voice, friends, he'll tell you that he loves you. He'll lead you and he'll guide you by his Holy Spirit that when we become a Christian, resides right inside of us. Isn't that wonderful? And so that's how we can hear his voice. He lives right within us. When we invite Christ into our heart and the Holy Spirit comes in, the comforter. And so his voice is going to be a voice of comfort. It's going to be a voice that gives us direction. It's going to be a voice of truth because the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. What a wonderful thing to know him. So to know that Christ is reigning on his throne. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It says it will never end. Uh, it's been 2,000 years since this triumphal entry <clears throat> where they were worshiping Jesus. And sometimes we have a hard time even singing. They were yelling out Hosanna to the King of Kings. It's okay to get excited about God and what he's done for us. He's rescued us from eternal damnation, giving us a hope for all eternity. So here we see that this throne is an eternal throne. <clears throat> it will last forever and ever. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> Revelation 5 is a picture again of Christ reigning on the throne It says, then I saw, and this is the Apostle John. We were just reading from John about the triumphal entry. John was then, uh, they tried to kill John. Uh, they put him, according to, it's not in the Bible, but to Fox Books of Martyrs. Tradition says they tried to put him in a boiling cauldron of oil to kill him. It didn't affect him at all, and so he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And it was on this Isle of Patmos that John received the revelation of the end times. This revelation that we have in our Bible. And he penned that, and he wrote it to the churches. Uh, he, he penned it for us. God allowed him to have this revelation. And here in this revelation that he's seen with his own eyes, <clears throat> he's seen this, he, he gives us a little picture into heaven. He says, then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was written on the inside and outside, writing on the inside and outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, who is, who is worthy to break the seals of the scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. <clears throat> then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and to read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Who is that? And we still have some echoing here. I'm not sure why, but um, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, from the tribe of Judah. <clears throat> the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to whose throne? 
David's throne. See how it's all unfolding in Jesus. The heir to the throne of David. That promise made in 2 Samuel to, to David, you will never, this, this kingdom will never end. I'm going to bless you and your descendants. <clears throat> the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then it talks about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> it says here, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, they saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen, and the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb. Picture of heaven and God's kingdom. I mean, we are talking about an everlasting kingdom and it's a rich kingdom. It's not like our kingdom. We make paper money. You know what the currency is in heaven? They make streets out of pure gold. I am so glad there's no potholes in heaven. Isn't that cool? You talk about God is going to have streets out of pure gold. His kingdom it's going to be an amazing kingdom. He's going to set up his kingdom here on earth. And it says, for a thousand years there will be peace on planet earth. A thousand years. It's called the millennium. It's just around the corner. Just around the corner. It happens after the great tribulation period. A period of seven years, right? Seven years on planet earth. The great tribulation and that's where things really get tough. And that's where, you know, we've talked about this. But that's where if you're going to buy or sell or do anything on planet Earth, you have to take what? The mark of the Antichrist. He's not going to say, I'm the Antichrist. I'm, not, I'm the devil, right? He's not going to say that. It's going to be a leader, a world leader. Uh, they're going to bring peace to Israel. It'll be a short peace. <clears throat> They'll sign a peace treaty. These are things to be looking for. They'll sign a peace treaty. And... There will be peace on planet Earth for three and a half years. Now, most people, most Christians believe that the church will be raptured out before that great tribulation period. I like that. Don't you? How many like that idea? Let's get out of here before, beforehand, all right? Three and a half years into that, that's when... That's when really all hell will break loose on planet earth and if you don't have this mark you can't buy food for your kids you can't do this so if the church is gone those who were witness to then <clears throat> beforehand they're still here if the church is taken out of here all the christians are gone can you imagine what that's going to look like and so so then those people will remember oh i was in that church that one time that pastor said i shouldn't take that mark 666 that mark and if i do I can never be saved. And then they start reading their Bible and, 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 and they, they, they start following Christ. There'll be many that will do that. That's good. If we're here during that time, here's the wonderful thing. God will never put us through anything we can't take. And there'll be many that will be martyred during that time. And so the key is to always be ready. I had a little girl call me, Pastor, I'm really afraid in our school we're studying, she's at a Christian school, we're studying about the end times, and I was really afraid when they talked about the mark of the beast and the Antichrist and what's going to happen, and, and we had just a wonderful talk. And I said, you know, when I was a young boy, too, when I was 12, when I became a Christian, I said, I thought <clears throat> Jesus was coming right away, too. And we, we all have felt that, and they have for years, because he wants us to be ready. But we still have to keep living today. And we don't have to walk around in fear because the Lord's going to take care of us. But we do have to be ready. And the way we're ready is by having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the way, isn't it? And so, so all of this, we see this picture. And I had many more notes, but I'm not going to go through them all today. <clears throat> but Christ's business. He says, occupy until I come. Occupy until I come. What does that mean? Well, keep going about your Father's business in heaven. What did Jesus leave us to do as his business? Just think. Now, here we talked about the, 
uh, the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. We talk about everyone's Hosanna, hail to the King of the Kings. But what did King Jesus tell us to do to occupy until he would come? What was the main thing he told us to do? He told us before he ascended to the Father in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, go into all the world and preach the good news of Jesus, the gospel, to all nations, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. That's why we read from the Bible here. That's why this isn't just some kind of club. We read from God's word to teach what Jesus has taught from the word. He has so many teachings for us, doesn't he? And, and so we teach from his holy word. Teach all of my disciples to observe everything I've commanded you and baptize all nations. Baptize these people in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And then he promised us, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So God gave us work to do. Occupy until I come. Don't get distracted with this things of this world. The world is vying for our time continually, isn't it? This, this, this business and that business and how can I make this money and how can I do this and, and all of these things. And, but God wants us to focus. Even though we're living, we have to pay our bills. Yes, take care of our families. Keep the main thing the main thing. And that's following Jesus and doing what he's told us to do. Next Sunday is probably <clears throat> one of the busiest times in churches across the world. Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. People who don't even really believe in God, people who don't really have a relationship with him will be in church. <clears throat> they may not be there the rest of the year till Christmas, but they'll be in church next week. You have friends in your schools and in your neighborhoods that would probably come to church with you if you invited them. A simple invite. And in that invite, you would be honoring God and his command to go into all the world, to go to your neighbors, your family. And you'd be inviting them to come here next week, a wonderful message about Jesus Christ that can change their eternity. God wants us to do that all the time. But I want to encourage you this week, We've got cards out in front. You can take a card uh, just to invite a friend, somebody. Maybe it's just at the mall or anywhere. Here, I'd like to invite you to the church. Hope you can make it. We're having a brunch, something simple. Wednesday night, we're meeting here at 6.30, and we're going to go out to our neighbors, and we're just going to politely invite them to come to church next week because we know many never attend church. If you want to do that with us, you can be here next week at 6.30, Wednesday night. And so today... <clears throat> What does God want us to get out of this? First of all, he wants you to realize, as a Christian, you're a part of something greater than you ever imagined. You're a part of God's kingdom. You're a part of his kingdom. Actually, in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, you are Christ's ambassadors. That's pretty special, isn't it? Christ's ambassadors. Pretty neat. Jeff, you know, you can just tell people and they ask what you do, just tell them I'm, a, I'm an ambassador. Pretty cool, huh? Ambassador. Wow, who are you an ambassador for? Jesus Christ. That's a pretty impressive job, isn't it? And we are representing him to a lost and dying world all around us. We are his representatives. We are his hand to show love, to show kindness, and to help others come to know him. So I want to encourage you to do that, to do that. And maybe today you're here and you might say, Pastor, I don't even know if I have that relationship you might believe in God and have a head knowledge, but you've never had that intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what he wants with all of us. He wants to be intimate with us. He wants to speak to you. He wants you to hear his voice. He wants you to love his word and read, read the Bible and spend time with him on a regular basis because he loves you and he created you and he has a plan for your life, a plan for good and not for evil. We serve a great God. I'd like you to bow your heads in prayer. And as you bow your heads in prayer today, <clears throat> to consider how important it is to have this relationship with Jesus, not just you, but those neighbors and families, relatives, friends that may not know him personally. 
they need that relationship. And you may be the one that can make the difference in their life. As your heads are bowed, I want you to right now just say, God, who could I invite to church next week? Who could I invite? Just ask the Lord to put someone on your heart. Who could I call or who could I go to their home and just give them a nice invitation, tell them I'd love to have them come to church next week with us or with me. Just ask the Lord to put someone on your heart. And as you're considering that, maybe there's somebody here either watching online or in church today, you'd say, Pastor, I'm not even sure if I'm a part of that kingdom. Well, to be a part of that kingdom, you need to make Jesus your king, your Lord and Savior. To, to ask him to come into your life by faith to forgive your sin. It says he knocks at our heart's door. He's knocking at your door. And if you open that door, it says in Revelation 3.20, he'll come into you and he'll live with you. But you have to open that door from the inside. He'll never force his way upon anybody. Today, if you would say, I want to be a true Christian, I want to turn from my sin and follow Christ and his teachings, just slip your hand up and put it down. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. Just say, that's me, Pastor. I want to be a true Christian. I don't know if I am, but today I want to make that decision to follow you, give you just a moment. Sometimes at a time like this, there's a tug of war inside. <clears throat> but God wants you to make that choice. If I didn't see your hand or if you have questions about that that we could help you with, I'd love to set up a time where we could visit. I hope all of you have made that decision to follow Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would take these words today and that they'd go deep into our hearts. We thank you that, Jesus, you are the king and you're reigning and that you're coming back again. Help us to help others to be ready to meet you when you come. Bless each one here now. Thank you. Lord, for your faithfulness to us, in Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and close with the song today, and then if you need prayer, there'll be people to pray with you after the service. Feel free to come up for prayer if you'd like that. And again, next week, we have the brunch in between the two services, and so uh, come a little early next week, have breakfast, and, and then come on into church. God bless you.